Um, our final speaker for tonight is Mitchell Cole. Uh, Mitchell is an architectural designer and ADNZ board member. Based in Christchurch, he specialises mainly in residential projects with a strong focus on energy efficiency and sustainability. He recently won the Supreme ADNZ Design Award for his design for the Madras, Madras Street uh, House, also multi-unit national winner. Mitchell will talk about his work history, design philosophies and discuss some of his projects. Thank you, Mitchell. All right, thanks, guys. Hope everyone's well. Um, I uh, just realised I was supposed to be talking about history, influences, and de design philosophy. So I'll, uh, I've got it on two pen drives. I'll switch between the two. I did. Um, I'll quickly run through it in two parts, um, and then I was going to run through the Madras Street in a bit more detail. Uh, I'm not a natural speaker, so please bear with me. And um, I'll, it would help me out if you guys just butt in with any questions you've got, but if there's anything at the end, we can um, go through any questions then as well. Uh, I've um, also got my drawings on the computer as well, so I'm more than happy to sort of talk through any details and things like that if anyone's interested in seeing those, but um, to ask, I'll just um, run through photos and things like that. So um, I think, yeah, I guess um, in terms of my, my background in that, um, my old man is an architect. He, um, he's an architectural designer. He packed in being an architect after a while. Um, he uh, talked me out of the industry originally. I always wanted to be a designer. And he said, who, who the hell would want to do that? And I think it was probably wise words. Like I uh, listened to him for a wee bit and then uh, decided, no, I do want to do that. But he, um, he uh, yeah, he did stress how difficult it was, and um, I think it's uh, proven to be pretty true. Um, I studied at um, CPIT in Christchurch, did the Diploma in Architectural Te Technology. I didn't really go to course, to be fair. I um, just sort of worked for the old man, and uh, I then <coughs> just tried to teach myself as much stuff as I can. I, uh, I travel around the world as, uh, as much as I possibly can and sort of study their architecture and just do a lot of self, um, self sort of um, self-taught learning. Um, try and do several trips a year, um, at least one or one new country per year. Um, Brazil, Chile and Brazil in a couple of weeks' time and then Egypt uh, later in the year and then States again later in the year, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, my favourite country that I've travelled to uh, for architecture is hands down Iran. Uh, the, uh, if anyone has anyone been there, no. it's just absolutely mind blowing. Um, the architecture is just so monumental. Uh, I was just in awe the whole time. We spent a month there, and. Um, uh, I think the biggest challenge from that was just trying to work out how I can um, bring that back into my own practice um, because it's, it's very, very different. Uh, in terms of my own work, I, uh, I work for a couple of com companies. Um, I always wanted to start my own company um, but came out of school sort of realising I didn't know anything. So I sort of tried to select the right companies that were going to teach me how to run my own business and um, how to get as much experience um, in building as, as quickly as possible. So I did uh, two, two lots of two years for two different companies and uh, tried to move to London the week before the earthquakes. Got to London and trying to find a job and it was just massive layoffs and all that sort of stuff and everyone yelling at me, telling me to come home. So I came home and started my own um, company at at the end of the day, a pretty opportune time. The first few years were really slow. Well, everyone tried to work out what the hell was going on after the earthquakes. But um, now we've sort of got, I've got three staff um, and we've worked on quite a few projects. So I'll just quickly run you through before we get into Madras Street, some of the start things we're working on at the moment. Um, the way I got, for some reason how I've, um, how my business is rolled out is I end up probably 90% of my clients are um, builders and developers. So um, I don't really get the opportunity to do a lot of um, 
I get the opportunity to do some great houses, but not heaps to work directly with clients who are really invested in their projects. Um, it's sort of a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it means uh, I sort of do get a, l a little bit more free reign, but that's restrained a bit by costs. Um, but I really do love to work with clients who are just super excited about something and you sort of lose that personal thing when you're doing so much development work. So um, this one's going to be 11 uh, piece of houses in Fendleton, sort of uh, upper market area of Christchurch. Uh, each one is aimed to be sold for 4 million. So it's going to be a, a wee bit of work, but we're just starting to get into the design stages of those ones. And there's 11 of them. Yeah, well, the, the, the owner keeps getting um, more and more funding. He's trying to buy up as much sort of land every time a site comes that, that's bordering onto it. Because <laughs> um, in that sort of area in Christchurch, it's, um, it's really sort of quite expensive area. The land's expensive. It's 1500 bucks a square metre, but um, there's a lot of shitty houses in there still. So um, you can yeah, still pick up quite a bit of land. And they're all big sites too, like minimum 1,000 square metres. We started off, the first site that sort of spurred it on was 4,000 square metres. So, yeah. Um, through these, I'll, I'll run, try and run through them pretty quickly, but you'll see there's a lot of builders' own houses. So this is a builders' own house as well. Um, suppose done on a budget. Um, also, builder, really like him, he does not want to piss about. Um, he said he, he's had enough of engineers over the next last few years. Um, let's do it without it. So it's a hill site. Um, and done to 3604, so it was, um, it's, and it's finished. <coughs> I, don't, I just don't have any, um, a lot of these are finished, I just don't have the photos of them yet, and <coughs> construction photos aren't super fun. Uh, another development house, Fendleton, um, same sort of one, so they're all just, the more high-end ones, like they're all aiming for sale prices of sort of three to, three to four million. Um, build budgets of, uh, Usually, I mean, if you're talking commercial rates, sort of around about three and a half thousand a square metre, but um, I don't know what the builders end up doing them for. They try and wrangle it the best way they can. Um, this actually house is um, just finished, and it's, I've got to say, it's probably my, my most successful project just because of how, how well it went and how stoked the clients are. The, it is a private house, and they're just um, the nicest people, um, and uh, the builder's done an awesome job. It's just just quite a simple, straightforward, sort of um, cheaper house, but it's worked out quite well. Same sort of brief, um, same sort of area, that house. Um, I sort of made a little bit of a name for doing um, the, uh, doing sort of multi-unit residential. Um, in Christchurch, we don't have probably the um, density like you guys, so, um, we're lucky enough to be able to get away with not having all those problem fire issues that were just spoken about by keeping everything as either single or double storey but um, in line, so just sort of terrace type housing where we just have one simple intertenancy wall. These sorts of ones do have um, overhangs which does create a little bit of fun but they're nothing you can't get around. Uh, it's another view of that, those passive houses. We do um, do a wee bit of uh, sort of earthquake rebuilds, not through the insurance companies. We start, I did have a go at that early on in the piece, but they are just nightmares to work with. Just a bunch of people who don't know what they're talking about just end up being an absolute debacle. So, um, but we do take on earthquake rebuilds when um, the clients have been paid out. As long as the clients have had good advice through getting paid out and have been paid out a a fair amount, um, and this is one of them. It's um, got a budget of like five grand a square metre, but on, on the hill in Christchurch, I don't know how it sort of compares to you, your guys' prices, but that's, that's sort of getting pretty tight. Um, it's okay, it's doable. Doable for a nice house, but it, it's um, the clients really need to be controlled. And um, with these sorts of projects, with these sorts of clients, um, they are just, it's a, it's a different sort of thing, like after, um, coming into working for them after just dealing with um, either developers who know what they're doing, they know what they want, or clients who have sa saved up all their money or, and want to build and they're excited. Coming into dealing with someone who just does not want to build, 
is so pissed off with the insurance company for stuffing them about for six years. Um, they don't even have a clue about the building industry or how it works and, and think everyone's out to rip them off. It's a really different sort of um, uh, scenario to deal with and it takes a, it takes a lot more patience and um, yeah, some of the projects can really, really drag out. Um, this one's been in design for close to a year and I got an email um, the other day saying that they feel like they've been rushed and um, they'd like to come in with a big list of questions. <laughs> so I met them this morning, we just went through everything and yeah, it's fun. So do you do project management too, Mitchell? Uh, with in or everything or? No, just these private guys? Um, so it depends on the job. So mo most typically my, my services would be um, uh, through to building consent and then an hourly rate on um, for uh, construction OBS and I try and stay away from contract admin because whenever I do it, it, it no one really wants, I, well, I won't even do it hourly because I've been burnt way too much in the past when all of a sudden a builder and a uh, client start fighting and you're on a fixed fee and it just goes goes um, to shit so um, but then if I'm doing it on hourly rate then things get a little bit awkward when um, we do ask charging a lot and I don't know how everyone else feels about that but that's, that's how I, how I see it so um, yeah I try and sort of limit the obs and things like that um, and just be really clear about what I'm there to, to help the clients out with um, yeah no well, that's the same uh, multi that was sort of just halfway through the drawings um, So the, yeah, this one is um, uh, in the same sort of area with Fendleton. It's sort of yeah that, that um, upmarket, built-up area. There's a lot of glory projects, but generally the sort of fabric of the area is quite um, like a, a heritage area with a lot of sort of what would be t homestead type houses. So we're trying to design within that sort of context, but still do our, our modern modern sort of spin on things. And this is the exact same area again as well. Um, where we um, trying to sort of um, do a modernist thing, but sort of keep it in, in, in I guess maybe more of a timeless. Um, this one's sort of arcing back to the Christchurch School um, of Design, which I'll talk about more later. later. A couple more, not so much. And I think that's probably it. Um, when, a few years ago I did a project, um, I was sort of getting into a bit of like um, the sustainability side of things, the energy efficiency, and um, had a client who um, was into it as well and um, had a bit of money or something or needed to do something with some money and decided he wanted to do an, um, like a, a, a development that would sort of um, be a long-term investment for him and sort of adhere to his beliefs. So that's sort of the, the first project that I got into that and um, it's this one which um, I won't really talk too much about because I'm going to be talking about it at the Medium Density Housing Summit but um, it was just a, a block of um, eight uh, student, accommodate, uh, student units, each unit being five um, bedrooms, so 40 units and um, it was the first eight star home star rated uh, multi, well, and the first home star rated multi development um, in, in New Zealand. Um, and that's the sort of one I sort of, I, I kind of cut my teeth with on the um, energy efficient, sustainable sort of side of things. I just quickly ran you through this one, and this is, um, I chose it because it's like quite a typical one in terms of like how we do our detailing and um, when we talk about our sustainability energy efficient side of things um, it's still quite a hard sell we find like definitely people are a lot more into it um, there's uh, the super home movements up up here now is it do you, yeah is anyone a member of super home movement not many yeah um, it was like started by Bob Burnett um, in Christchurch and, he, and he's um, done a lot of work towards sort of trying to promote how we can try and build better uh, and we put my Madras Street house in it this year and it was just a really interesting thing to see. Um, it just got so much attention, so many people through it, um, but got, no, got zero work out of it. A lot of people have that really great intent or these ideas, um, but it's really, I still find it really hard after everything to try and um, 
to get it into the buildings and get it past that sort of um, uh, the, the budget cuts and things. So this is the sort of typical one that we end up doing, which um, we try and sort of, we design them for, for passive solar, passive ventilation. Um, we bump up the insula, we use 140 frame walls, LVL with a RAB board and no dwangs, um, and bump up the insulation as much as we can in that. But we use uh, Terra Lana insulation, which sort of gives a little bit less uh, value. Um, and try and just cut down, try and get the detail in as well as, as best we can to cut down the thermal bridging. And that includes um, if we can possibly talk the builder into not using uh, pre frame and framing on site. So, um, this is just yeah, a, a multi unit, um, but they're separated. So, sort of development of a couple of standalone townhouses um, on a tight site in Christchurch. Uh, typically, our sites in Christchurch, inside this, the four abs where we do a lot of work, they're fift, uh, 50 metres long by 10 metres wide, which is just a, a real pain in the ass dimension to try and deal with. Um, it really limits us to doing only two. Within the city plan, we can um, just the general planning rules, they don't really consider this, the proportions of the site, and um, we can only do two, two developments on it, two houses on it, sorry. Um, but they also have a rule saying that we need to do more. So we can't actually, like the typical site inside Christchurch, we can't actually comply with the city plan, which is just yeah, a bit ridiculous. Um, so this is a yeah, 500 square metre central city site and we could only get two, two dwellings on it, which is pretty crap, really. Doesn't meet the density requirements. Yeah, so this, these clients were um, sort of building their own uh, retirement house and we built one on the front as a, a spec that they sold off to and funded a um, fair portion of the one on the back. And they were happy at the end of the day. So um, this is, I guess, the main one I wanted to get into. Um, it sort of came about, I didn't really ever think I'd, I'd, this is my own house, I didn't really ever think I'd um, do my own house, I always hear about like the, the dilemmas designers have with trying to do their own place and um, budget blowouts and all that sort of stuff and uh, so I was never really that interested. But um, through the last sort of seven odd years I got so many projects cancelled because they were, they were just going to be quite nice but um, just ended, ended up not being able to afford it or a lot of ideas that I was really trying to push with clients but they were still just ideas and the clients were um, didn't really want me experimenting with their money um, <laughs> which I think is a bit unfair but um, so I found this site it actually took me a while once we decided to do it it took me quite a while unfortunately I missed out on quite a few um, probably better sites for cheaper, missed out on them by a couple of grand here and there and in the end the real estate agent felt sorry for me and just went door knocking and um, found this site and I got it. So that was it. Beauty. Uh, it was so it's 10 metres wide but this one, well, the one, the sites I talk about being 10 by 50, they run north-south um, but on the roads that run north-south the end of the blocks that are only 10 by 30. So that's ideal because I didn't want to do two houses on f um, 500 square metres, it was just too big for me. Uh, so I wanted to find the, the smallest sites I could possibly. Um, so I got this one, it's uh, 10.6 so is the standard dimension by 30, uh, so 306 square metres. Had this bad boy on it, it was stuffed. We tried to move it, um, we try and push for like uh, sustainability in sort of every aspect and that includes reusing as much stuff, tried to move it, it fell to pieces, so I managed to find it, there's a demo contractor I use who um, takes the pit um, houses apart by hand and uh, recycles absolutely everything, so that was awesome, he did that. Um, because he recycles everything he gets money for it, so did it for free. 
which is cool. So we just started picking it to pieces. Um, so where we got to, found out those bricks were bricks from the original house. Um, so the original house being 1847 or something. So that was great. That cost me five grand in archaeologist fees. <laughs> after, after they had been all talked about on site and just taken to the dump. And then, oh, by the way, yeah, they were, they were the original handmade bricks. That's in there. Um, I'll try, like, being my own house, there's a, I put a lot of thought into it. Um, I think I'll, I'll try and run through as much as I can. But, yeah, do, do stop me if there's anything you want to know more detail about or any questions as, as we go along. Um, I don't know what your guys' ground is like up here, but perhaps there's some areas that are similar with your estuaries and that you've got, but we've, uh, our ground in Christchurch is just stuffed. It's um, the Waimak River north of us, Just as we're on the sort of a plain, it's in a, a marshy area. It used to run through every sort of thousand years um, and then another forest would grow and then the Waimak would run through. So we've got real thin layers of gravel on like six metres of peat. 150 gravel, six metres a piece, so it's just it's just real, real shit. Um, every site's different solution. They're crazy, some of the solutions that we get on some of these sites, um, whether we're dealing with organics or high water or um, lateral spread, which really kills projects. Um, as a side note, actually, that's why I end up doing a lot of um, high-end houses is because th those ground conditions, um, they need to be brought back up to sort of a certain level and cost a certain amount irrelevant of the cost of the building or the cost of the land. So it's only people who are spending several million dollars on a house can really afford to spend a couple of hundred thousand on, on ground improvements. So um, we don't, yeah, unfortunately, it's pretty hard to, um, to do sort of... Uh, affordable housing and um, what makes it worse is the sort of cheaper areas in Christchurch are some of them that have got some of the worst worst ground. Um, in this situation it was a new foundation that I wanted to do. Um, what we get is a lot of clients they just absolutely fix like the only floor you can possibly have there's no question about it, it has to be a concrete foundation. I, I don't know why the hell that is like I, I mean I do know that you know concrete does give decent thermal mass um, if you don't cover it too much with carpet and things like that or timber but um, I don't I don't see why like uh, timber floors are, I think are the way to go in Christchurch um, when you've got a concrete foundation we have to design so it doesn't get damaged whereas a timber foundation we can design it so it can get damaged but it's easily to be repaired um, in the situation I I wanted to sort of keep the building off the ground um, and have it really easily, like quite robust, but really easily um, re-leveled. So we tried it with um, screw piles, but cantilevering the screw piles out of the ground so that instead of um, just having them buried into the ground and something on top, we um, use these things, uh, just eight of them for the whole building. Uh, they were bloody accurate when they driving them in, I don't know how they do it, but um, got them within millimetres. Typical thing in Christchurch is we need to sort of do a foundation for the machines or the machines sink. So it's a bit annoying when you're doing your landscaping. Um, did a perimeter, steel perimeter beam just to uh, reinforce it, but I want to, I think I've got it, yeah. So um, screw pile underneath, uh, this plate butt welded onto the top of it with the PFC slotted out and then um, just holes in the back and under, I don't have it on the other side but basically this, this PFC um, perimeter beam just sits on top of this plate, just shim to get it the right level. Uh, if I can get a base enough bigger than like a tile for the jacks then it should be a um, couple of hours, eight jacks and um, should be able to re-level it up to 120 mils. Uh, all the services are flexible or um, can be cut off quite easily. Um, and that's 120 mil slot. And then if, it, if we need more than that re-leveled, then, um, then we can just do some welding. So it's quite an easy way to re-level it. 
one of the things I really wanted to do in, in um, projects, I did convince a few clients to actually get me to design it into their projects, but they never got built, was um, using cross-laminated timber from XLAM. So I was pretty stoked to deal with that. I wanted to see um, what it would be like as a thermal mass. Uh, I'll go into more detail on that later. So the day it arrived was the worst weather ever. Um, we had to keep stopping the crane, a couple of hundred K winds um, in between sort of this. And uh, being only a 300 square metre site, we've got two buildings, there was barely any um, space on the site, which I didn't even think about prior to them turning up. So. It was a pretty intense uh, couple of hours trying to work out stacking all the bits to be able to unload it with only just enough room for a crane, really, on the site. Um, so that's them all stacked up, sort of half on the building, half off, room for the crane. Then it was really super fun um, laying them all in place. Like the whole building started to come together so quickly with the uh, um, screw piles, steel beam <coughs> perimeter was um, about a week and then they, within a week these were down, like they went down within a couple of hours but just trying to stage the contractors. So it was really about a week and a half and we were up to this stage, which was pretty, pretty cool. Um, I just went for the LVL on the, um, oh sorry, the CLT on the two floors and the shear walls on the side there and the, um, the stairs, which I'll show you later. Uh, just while we're on fire, we, we, used, um, we used speed wall. Uh, at that time, the, the jib barrier line wasn't, barrier line? Barrier wall? Barrier line. Barrier, yeah. yeah, that wasn't out. We, uh, we use that now, but um, <coughs> this, uh, yeah, having that, having that um, really solid, um, not just fire, but um, great acoustic insulation and not, being, not needing to penetrate it is just ideal. Don't know why it wasn't done years and years ago. Um, just, yeah, tr we didn't go, in a few jobs we get into that real tricky detailing um, where you got a, like either a 90 or 140 frame wall, um, airtight liner, then like a services cavity with insulation and all that sort of stuff, but it, the price just sort of starts to get about a, out of control. Um, so in this situation we just went for 140 um, LVL with d no dwings as, as discussed. Um, one mistake I made was I should have just gone the twin skin CLT roof as well. Um, I tried to save a wee bit of cost, but we had really bad weather and um, uh, it was tarped, which I don't have, for months and months, which sucked. And then um, the bit of moisture got into the top of the, uh, the CLT floors and they, they expanded quite a bit. Um, we had to sand them back quite a bit at the end of the job. So yeah, I think that's the key thing is um, that CLT trying to keep it as dry as possible. If we'd gone the twin skin CLT ceilings, roofs that would have just been on really quickly, like an extra week or two, and um, then we pretty much would have been watertight, at least sort of like it's had its roof on. Um, so that's sort of all I've got for the construction picks, but I'll run you through all the, all the um, finish picks and I'll sort of talk through a lot of the design that we put into it. Um, with this side I was uh, real, well I felt quite lucky with the setback of the neighbour's fence at six metres. So that's still the neighbour's site, all that bit there. Um, I don't know why, why it was set back like that, whether maybe it was like some sort of road, in, road widening or something. Uh, it's quite a real busy intersection just up here, this is in Central City. This area, like these three blocks, I, I consider them to be one, like the second sort of best place in Christchurch to live just because it's got a, a tight community. 
Um, it's inside the four avs, but it, it's actually got like a community association and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and most of the site, most of the area um, had been developed quite a lot or quite heavily in the early 90s. So that, that building, that building, obviously um, awesome sort of late 90s buildings, new denim blue, direct fix poly. Some of them are, I mean, that's got that crappy steel that um, has gone white. Uh, and I really wanted to d design within the context of the neighborhood, but there's lots of shit, shit design. <laughs> Um, growing up with my old man as a designer in the 90s, he did, everything was new denim blue, and I grew up hating it. And I never ever put it on a house before, and I just just ripped into people who did, um, which is super weird because by the time I we got round to choosing the colours for this. Uh, we found that new denim blue was gonna, was definitely definitely the best the best solution. So I just sort of ate my words a bit, and then was, after that I've, I've come come around a bit against the new denim blue. Um, we this isn't allowed under the city plan. You got to have uh, screening from the car parking and all that sort of stuff, which with a ten metre so wide site is just impossible. So I have not developed the first six metres of the site, and then I just decided to put asphalt down. Um, <laughs> what I liked about that is, yeah, it gives me two car parks per unit on a 300 square metre site, which is kind of, you don't really get in with that sort of stuff. Um, tried to tie into this building, like the forms are, yeah. lucky it's obscured, obscured by the trees, but um, quite a large flat roof, concrete building, um, so at least I sort of relate to this building with the, with the fence, I hope. Um, try to keep these forms and scale kind of similar as these four units in here. And uh, just similar sort of roof pitch and new denim blue. You don't find anyone using those car parks? Randoms? Yeah, quite often. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, oh great, you know, like this is, this is like the public area and then this is my site, but it's a bit too public. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. Do you them? <laughs> no, I think like they know, but they, you see them sneaking away. <laughs> um, one of the major philosophies of the, the building was, there's a couple, couple of major ones. One was the one of the building that would wear in and not wear out. Um, oh, so many of the houses we do is, uh, you know, they, well, all of them really. The best they're ever going to look is when they're finished, and then they're just going to get more and more uh, worse over time. So I really wanted to choose all the materials of that would sort of age over time, maybe get a bit better, um, at all, and ones that would get damaged, or at least that's how I justified the CLT on the floors exposed to myself, is that it would just get damaged and damaged and damaged and then have um, a bit of character to it. I didn't really want anything that needed to be maintained or that would, could be easily damaged. <laughs> the other sort of, the other design philosophy was um, that my... <coughs> when it comes to architecture, I guess there's, a, there's my three favourite things and that would be um, brutalist buildings, the Christchurch school buildings and um, Alpine huts. The Brutalist buildings in Christchurch still kind of tie in together. Um, not sure if anyone knows too much about it, but Sir Miles Warren, mid 50s, designed a couple of apartments, Dorset Street flats, uh, taking sort of cues from Brutalist. But I mean, I think the, the, the clearest description of it was um, an ethic that's still an aesthetic. Um, and they're beautiful, beautiful buildings. They've, They've carried on, um, it became the Christchurch School of a bunch of awesome designers, um, Sir Peter Bevan and the likes, and uh, there's a massive collection of just absolutely amazing um, sort of 60s through to, uh, well, it really actually up until now, but um, most of them were 60s, 70s. And I really wanted to sort of take some cues from that. Uh,
uh, it's unfortunate that like, qu quite a lot of them got demolished in the earthquakes because one of the hallmarks <laughs> was um, unreinforced masonry. Uh, one of the classic examples of well, it's the form, the gable to gable form, uh, and the Canterbury, the tray roofing wrapping down the sides with Canterbury prickles. There's uh, one thing we do Canterbury prickles often on the on the ridge line, but I haven't had the guts to do Canterbury prickles on a on a shoulder like that on a client's house just because of the risks. So. I thought I'd do it on my own one and see if that leaks before I do it on someone else's. Can you explain what a canary prickle is? So, um, it's where you have the tray roofing, it's in one sheet, and you basically cut the rib of the tray roofing and fold it down the side. So then you, as you fold it, those ribs open up, and then you have like a, a handmade flashing, the prickle that sort of slots on over the top, and it's just, yeah, and it's just, it's just, um, it's just silicon dome. So that's okay when it's uh, on the rib, on the ridge, because it forms its own little ridge cap. Uh, as long as it sort of stays in place and there's not too much wind blow blowing rain, then it should be pretty weather tight. But with this, you've got all the rain running straight down and straight onto the, the um, yeah, the prickle. I do like all the buildings we do. We always use um, structural cavity battens. 45 mil cavities, and that's one thing I was going to ask. Your cavity battens that are 3.2, are they 45 by 45? Uh, no, we have made Yeah, because they're really hard to find. Yeah, <laughs> well, I always get, I sometimes turn up deciding the builders are making their own cavity battens, which is not, not ideal. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we always do that. I flashed it, um, kick out flashings under, behind it as well. We flashing tape the actual cut in the rib. Did everything I possibly can, but hopefully, hopefully should be right. So I guess yeah, just general site over overview: six meters of car parking from here forward, and then um, basically this whole building's set out in terms of the mostly in terms of the the. Um, the bulk that we're allowed to do within the city plan, so four by six um, outdoor areas, recession plans of different angles, another outdoor area, and that sort of left me with what I what I could do. Kind of handy that it, the internal portions worked out. Um, I wanted a, a to be a, it's a multi-unit, like it's, so it's two two-bedroom units, um, but I didn't want them to feel like they were sort of attached or apartments. I don't mind that personally, but I know so just the general New Zealand uh, um, attitude is that everyone needs to have their own their own separate slice of paradise. So um, we have it. So this is our front gate, our two car parks, neighbours two car parks, and then they've got their own alleyway down the back. Uh, we don't overlook them. I couldn't even know if they were coming or going or anything like that. So. Uh, tried to keep it as, as private as possible and that's as, also as private as possible from the neighbouring properties as well which I'll, I'll talk about later. See so yeah, it's just a side view from, from the neighbour's roof. Uh, that's the alleyway. Got a friend who was an upcoming artist um, to do that for us so that was quite cool before he got too famous. Um, one of the things uh, about the architect, the three things that I love about, or well, my favourite things about architecture is the form of, um, of huts and how they're totally wrapped in steel and how there's, there's well, usually direct fix just, just cladded on, on the building. Uh, you don't see any fascias, spoutings, all that sort of stuff. And I re for me, it was really important to get that line along there really just really crisp with no flashing and likewise um, having the the steel on glass details so to get the um the cortine to work like that we and cortine is the, i think the perfect product to to do it with and um, we chucked it on a rain screen it is a watertight rain screen um, i'm going to take this has been on here for 14 months now, so I'm going to take it off maybe the end of this winter and just see what see what the story is behind there. Um, 
we built it up with a so a standard 45 mil structural cavity batting, shadow clad, painted, then a shadow clad batten painted, and then the the core tent over the top. So the shadow cladding is just pretty t traditionally detailed, really. And then um, just a 12 mil micro cavity. And then silicon, just silicon around the edges around um, to silicon, just to sort of stop any wind driven rain around those three sides, um, getting into the, the cavity of the rain screen. Just to mention, I'll uh, maybe wrap up in about 10 minutes and we have questions. Sweet, yep. You're going to talk about your stairs. Yep. Um, so uh, one of the cool things that we could do with the CLT is that you can run it out with a canopy without too much tricky de detailing and still get that right to the ceiling look. Um, we put a beam in the, in the roof below, uh, sorry, in the wall above, and then screwed up into the, um, from the, the CLT up into the beam. That was all fine, you know, it was a great idea until we got to order the screws and they were 80 bucks each and at 80 mil centres. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a budget blowout. That's one thing with the CLT, you know, you price it up and all you think, oh, oh this is all great. Kind of, it's still expensive, but um, price it all up. And then you don't really realise that all those spec screws come to like six grand. So. Now the cool thing about CLT is they can pretty much route anything. Um, we used it as much as we possibly could by routering in strip lights. Uh, just, we just used B grade ply on the walls. The windows are um, uh, fiberglass. Pushed the limits a wee bit with what he could do in terms of the size. He had to make a few of them several times. Uh, but the, it's really great. Like one of the things about the CLT and well, everything we tried to do is um, I hope that the CLT would work a wee bit better. Like we sort of worked out the volumes and all that for the um, CLT to, or timber mass to work as a thermal mass. I guess what we didn't really calculate is how the CLT, 200 mils thick, it being timber, it's a wee bit of an insulation value and it insulates itself. So I think we sort of wasted a bit of money um, and resources by going so thick. We should have just gone, gone lower and I think the thermal um, performance of the house would be <coughs> exactly the same. But the other thing we wanted to do is make sure it's super airtight and, um, and all the surface temperatures being as warm as possible. So just taking all those, those cues from passive house, but uh, it would never be passive house because the glazing temperature uh, is only double glazed and that will never meet the the surface temperature um, requirement for the passive house. So the steer we did in CLT as well is probably the one, one of the things that worked out the best for the cost saving measures. It's probably the cheapest architectural steer I've ever done. Um, shear wall routed out all these um, treads all the way through, and then on this stringer, routed them out, um, I can't remember, 20 mils or something, and just slid, slid them all through. And then used just a cheap commercial um, tread nosing, uh, sorry, I just run through the, just, yeah, to give it the, the anti-slip, but um, a bit of uh, definition too, so I was, we were quite happy with how, how that turned out. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do in, uh, put into the building was uh, compact laminate as a, as a kitchen um, product. Used all the time in Europe and all that. It was an absolute nightmare. Um, no one wanted to do it. Uh, it. Just stuff like that burnt out three guys' drills trying to cut through it. And, um, but, we were, but we got it in there in the end. And... Uh, we're pretty happy with how, how, how it looks and how robust it is. Gives you cool opportunities to do things like having that. So being black all the way through, you can um, utilise it with the, the black detailing. So all, everything else we've got sort of black negative details and that. Um, so we felt that that blue acts as a bit of a counterpoint for all the timber, but um, 
also ties in with the, the detailing through the rest of the place and yeah, get to do those sorts of things. Try and get, uh, we've got heat, heat recovery um, units, ventilation units. We use the Lunos Next downstairs, single, single unit, and then E2s upstairs. Um, I actually found I like the E2s a bit better. These are things that are supposed to be awesome, but I find the E2s just perform a bit, little bit better. And we always, in all the smaller units we do, we, we have, um, above the stairwell, we always put in a, uh, electric skylight with rain sensor and then somewhere down low have a, a low um, small window that you can wind out just to keep be able to keep the place ventilated well with um, good security still. One of the things um, we tried to do was reduce the amount of total resources going into the building but also the volume of the space inside the building that we need to heat and that by um, bringing the shoulders down um, as, as far as possible. If we brought them down to um, a metre and then strategically put in skylights wherever we might need headspace. So a lot of skylights, but they, they're low and being the, the shoulders that are so, so low, they're low enough that they still kind of act a bit like windows, but give you total <laughs> privacy. Um, that's the ridge line of the neighbouring property. Uh, but also gives us the headspace, and um, and yeah, it's just great walking around in the nude up there in the central city, windows open, no one looking in. A um, lot of skylights though, but only two windows. We made sure all the lighting all the way through I wanted it to be um, I find we always over light our houses so um, wanted to just really make sure it was as, as low as possible um, and so at night but this is just a four watt LED strip and it's the only light we'll have on and a couple and downstairs and it's just just enough to see like you wouldn't want to read with it but it's it, but you know, if you're not reading, then it's totally fine and it's just awesome. You come home from work, it gets dark and it's just a real good wind down. Uh, with all our smaller apartments, we always um, try and do it where we have a shower room with a changing room sort of part of it um, with like a slider or whatever we need to fit in. Vanity room separate toilet with a vanity in it as well because these apartments um, being students or whatever um, professionals there could be four people living in in quite a tight space uh, so this it means that people should all still be able to get ready with minimal disruption um, i think I, I might have missed that we uh the houses the two units are 74 square meters each um, the downstairs exact dimensions are dictated by the upstairs. Um, the upstairs being two bedrooms, the three sort of small bathrooms um, and a full wardrobe. And each bedroom actually by the way is three metres by three metres. Um, and that's a super king bed. So there's heaps of space. few budget blowouts throughout the project. Um, my partner decided that those tiles were the absolutely only tile that we could possibly have in our house. Um, and I like them too, but they were really, really expensive. Um, handmade Italian ones, <coughs> weird sizes, so that they cost just as much to put in as they did to buy. So, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people say they love the shower, but I don't love it that much. Yeah, it took one guy um, two and a half weeks to lay those tiles. Wanted the, wanted, and um, checked out on the back wall, uh, wanted to make it yeah, feel like as much like a spa or something. Uh, yeah, we totally landscaped every inch of the place. 
Uh, I wanted it to look as sort of tie in with the house as much as possible. Other than the veggie garden, um, all, the, all the plants are sourced from a list from a friend who's a landscape architect who um, categorised all the native plants that would have been on that site prior to um, European settlement. <laughs> so I just go. So um, I did have a. I didn't get pinged on it with the council, but I did have a big theory, a, a big planned RFI response for them. Uh, they. Um, We've got a, a water, like a, a one metre strip of planting on the south side, and that's where most of the water goes down. Um, my theory was that we're allowed to do four metres um, of drive and go into a one metre planting strip, so why can't it be four metres of roof? Um, then on the north side, most of it's actually um, uh, canopy, and that goes into the, the, um, the stormwater, the council one, and then that, the rest of it goes into the, the, the veggie garden there. So that canopy still has a, a spouting. Um, so that was my plan, if the council pinged me. They didn't, it went through, a lot of people saw it through the super home movement, council started getting all these calls saying, hey, we weren't allowed to do it. And then they went back through my drawings and called me up and said, oh yeah, you're not actually allowed to do that, stop doing it. But I've done it on about five jobs beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not allowed anymore. <laughs> okay, that's actually the end of it, so <coughs> that's ideal. A couple more photos. So. Any, any other questions? Or? Um, I had spec three mil. Um, that was the smallest, thinnest I could find at the time, but when we actually got to build it, we found 2.5. What was your square metre rate? Yeah. Yeah. So, oh no, I don't mind saying um, one of the problems we have with the super home movement and that um, with what Bob Bunet pushes is that it's affordable. Um, we look at like sustainability and affordability through minimised resource. So, it's 74 square metres. It's a small place. It's just all we need. But it's a high quality build. It's not cheap. Um, and yeah, so it's 4,600, including just the square. But I'm, I, you know, some people say it's a lot, but it, you know, we do houses on the hill, five thousand a square all the time, and they're shit. <laughs> yeah, it looks cool. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've found out a few things since then. <laughs> I'm still hoping, hoping that I'm going to be going home and checking those stainless steel screws now. <laughs> With oh the roof, well, sorry the. the wall, like you said, you, you don't go to a creek up to now. Yeah. What, what's the reason for that? Oh, I just I, I, I hate looking you know, turning up to site and there's like a straight wall and then there's like four studs, side by side just because that was where the 600 studs sit and then they needed an extra 50 mils or whatever and then, and you just got it could have just been one stud or whatever or space the studs out better. But you end up with just timber everywhere. Like I, I hate looking at it, and you just got so much bloody studs everywhere. Can you use the R values or the Ah, uh, yep. So the the another thing why I overdid the floors being two hundred thick. So the floors are five point six, which is way too much for a floor. Um, the walls were, th I think, um, three point six, and the ceilings four point two. Uh, if, you, if, you know, if you came across another site, how was it kind of mentally for you? It was like, um, I re it, was, it, was a really, it was really good education, super expensive education, <laughs> but it was really nice to see that from the client's point of view, um, a lot of, yes, you know, you get hung up, I just pulling my hair out with subbies, just doing, people who just did not give a crap about anything except for doing their job. Um, the fastest way possible. The place got really, really damaged because it's not like, you know, it doesn't have a concrete floor and jib that you can plaster up if you scrape something down the side of it. So um, it got really damaged. And um, yeah, I think 
I don't, where would I build again? I'd be real keen to build again, but not for myself. I think mainly because I learned a lot of lessons on this where I um, should be saving money. Um, but that saving money would also reduce the quality of the build too. So, yeah, I'd like to do some more developments, learning some of the lessons from that, but just as developments probably. Should you put a plastic bag over it? You know, 30 grand or something, you know, for those budget papers, so it lets the damage that the rain causes? What do you mean, sorry? Well, you know, a lot of our jobs are originally to just put a plastic over the whole scaffolding and it completely pull through it. Just in closer. Well, in case, were well, you saying if it, if this is going to be leaking? Just, no, just during construction. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, yeah, I don't... Yeah, it's, it's because the, well, the shrink wrap wouldn't have, um, we, we needed to, we wouldn't have been able to have it on because we needed to have heaps of space around the top of it to get that, that those single trays of roofing wrapped around. Um, so I don't, and it was it was mainly the roofers that just took bloody forever. I think they underquoted it and decided that they were just going to fit it in, but they had like five months and they until I like really threw my toys out of the cop. But it, it was it took them like twenty hours work, but five months to do it. Uh, the, what the major the biggest thing would be to um, cut down that the thickness of the CLT down to um, like one three five instead of two o five. Um, I would try and brief subbies a lot better, I think. Um, I, would, I would just, uh, nothing special in terms of design, I would just probably take less shit from people. And um, yeah, I think I got ripped off quite a lot of tasters here and there, maybe because it was a bit different. Or, you know, I had three sheet metal metalers um, throw on the towel on cutting that steel. I, I mean, like, as designers, you get a job and it's a challenge, and you're like, great, let's do this, you know. I thought that'd be the same, you know, a bit of a challenge, but that nah, not interested. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Mitchell. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much.